Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning at Central United Methodist Church. My name is Amy Seifert. I'm the pastor here at Central. And a very special welcome to all of you who are joining us on our very first ever live stream. Uh, before all of this COVID-19 uh, epidemic and I guess pandemic at this point um, came about and became part of our daily lives, we at Central were working on uh, being able to live stream our worship services anyway. So uh, our timeline got moved up a little bit. And so uh, through this wonder that is technology, we are able to worship uh, this morning uh, via technology, via the the internet. And so if you are joining us by computer, if you are joining us by phone or tablet, uh, we are glad that you are here uh, worshiping with us this morning. If you are uh, joining us via Facebook, I would ask that you would please, uh, in the comment section below the video, just drop your name so we know that you were here. Uh, this is the way that we are taking attendance uh, during uh, this shelter-in-place time. And so let us know that you are here. If you are watching this video a little bit later uh, this day or even later this week, uh, drop the church an email to let us know that you, you worshiped with us this day. Uh, we are live streaming via Facebook, and so I have my phone here. I see uh, everyone who is uh, joining us for worship this morning. Thank you. Um, if you have a prayer request or if you have a comment that you would uh, like me to be aware of, go ahead and type it in. Uh, I'm not sure how much I'll be able uh, to look at my phone, but um, I will try to do that, especially as it comes closer to our prayer time uh, so we can share the, the joys and the concerns that are part of our community. As we prepare to uh, worship at this time, I would invite you to center yourself. Uh, it's been a crazy week for me. I'm sure it's been a crazy, work, a crazy week for you as well. And so let's take this time to, uh, to return our focus to the Creator, to the one uh, who is in control even when things seem that they are out of control. And so whatever you need to do uh, to be able to focus on this time of worship, I would invite you to do that. If you would um, like to take a couple of deep breaths or if you would uh, like to light a candle uh, in your presence that, that reflects uh, the spirit being there with you, I would invite you to do that. Uh, our music director, Karen Puckett, joins me today, today as well. And uh, she is going to share a prelude with us to help us um, focus on this time of worship. So Karen, would you please share with us? Thank you, Karen. Uh, we are trying to make uh, this worship experience for you be as much uh, like it would be if you were sitting here in the sanctuary this morning. And so when we have uh, parts of our liturgy uh, for you to participate in, you will see those on your screen. And so uh, the words that you will will uh, use uh, will be there. So as those uh, screens go back and forth, uh, I invite you to 
be as participatory in our worship this morning uh, as you would like to be. And so with that in mind, I would ask that you would join me in a call to worship. Um, as those words appear on your screen, you would uh, say the words that would be in yellow. So at this time, would you please join me? Our lives feel all disjointed as though they were a valley of dry bones. But the Spirit of God will bring connection and continuity to our lives. The Spirit of God breathes hope into each one of us. The Spirit of God challenges us to be a people of faith. Open our hearts, Lord, and bring us to your light. Open our lives, Lord, and break us free from doubt and fear. Amen. Our opening hymn, or excuse me, an opening prayer uh, that I would invite you to join in at this time. Let's be in an attitude of prayer. God of life, present and promised, you are the one to whom we call. For you are the one who hears, and you are the one who acts, bringing us new life with your grace and love and power. Lead us in our time of worship, that we may be prepared to follow your lead in places where life is at risk, places where hope seems far away, places where dreams die during sleep. Help us live the teachings we proclaim within these places of worship. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is I Stand Amazed in the Presence. Uh, if you would join, it doesn't matter where we are, where two or more are gathered, even virtually, uh, God is present with us. So let us join in our opening hymn.
this time, I would invite you to uh, join me in a time of prayer uh, a little bit differently than we would normally do. Uh, I will open us with prayer, and then you will have a few minutes in the middle of our prayer uh, to pray silently on your own for those uh, that you are concerned about, to give thanks uh, for the things, the good things that have happened to you this week. And so at this time, I would invite you to join me in our time of prayer. Eternal God, we come before you with the mixtures of feelings and a need of confession. We hear of the sufferings of Jesus, yet resist hardship for ourselves. We set high expectations for others, but we resist them for ourselves. We clamor for attention to our needs, but are often unfeeling toward the needs of others in our world. We are lenient with our own faults, but severe with the faults of others. We are weak when things go poorly and self-satisfied when they go well. We are quick to speak and slow to listen. We often judge on outward appearances before discovering the character within others. God, we ask that you be patient with us and that you continue to help us. Forgive us our foolish and selfish ways. Be patient when we slip and falter. Lead us onward in moments of despair and disequilibrium. Above all, make us ever aware that you extend your great graciousness and love to us. Make us also aware that we cannot pray and acknowledge your presence without also bringing with us all of your other children of this world. They stand with us this day. Help us embrace them in our concern, our sisters and brothers in Christ, the wayward and the hateful, the broken and the lost, the warring and the destructive, even our enemies, the suffering and the defeated. Help us to make room in our hearts for all your children, however unattractive they may be to us. Help us to be loving people and make room in our hearts for all. Cause us to reach out and to find that special task to which you would call each of us. Father, we lift our world to you for those who have been affected by this coronavirus. God, we ask for your healing to be upon each of its victims. We ask you to provide strength and encouragement to those who are medical personnel who are fighting the fight to help make people well. Father, we lift to you all who are impacted in any way by this epidemic. For those who are wondering where the money is going to come from to pay their bills, give them your peace. Provide for them. For those who are Tending to children who are now at home, provide patience and peace to them. Father, we lift to you those whom we are concerned and worried for, as well as give you the thanks for the blessings that we have received this week. And each of us prays in our own voice. And as your people, we join with one voice in the prayer that you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn is Lamb of God. I invite you to join where you are. We are continuing our walk with Christ uh, during the final week of his life. Uh, this was our worship series uh, before um, all of the uh, shelter-in-place orders came in time. And during this worship series, we have been looking at uh, lessons that we can learn from the final week of Christ's life, the final walks that he took to, um, to see what those lessons teach us about our own spiritual discipline and spiritual practices. And I'm continuing with this series because right now, while we aren't able to meet uh, corporately together as the body of Christ, those individual practices become even more important for us. Um, and so we are working our way through the final week of Christ's life, and today we are looking at the events that happened on Wednesday. We have been using the Gospel of Mark, uh, using his accounts of those final days uh, for a specific, specific reason, and that's because Mark was very particular, was very careful to indicate each day, the beginning of each day of that week. And so um, we've discovered that these events, um, it's easier to follow and keep track of, of the final days of Christ's life if we use Mark's gospel. And so far in this series, we've talked about a few spiritual disciplines. Uh, the first we talked about was studying scripture, why it's important to know and understand who God and who Christ is. We've looked at worshiping, uh, whether we do it uh, corporately, kind of like we're doing right now, even though we aren't in the same room, we have still gathered together and are worshiping corporately, uh, and how to do that individually as well. And the series, or excuse me, the day of Wednesday brings us to our next, our next spiritual practice, which is serving. And so let's begin uh, by hearing the text 
from Mark about Wednesday. It, it starts in chapter 14, and here's what he has to say. It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him, for they said, not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar, a very costly ointment of nard, and she broke open the jar and poured the, poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, why was the ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body before its burial. <clears throat> Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. <clears throat> Excuse me, may God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word. There's actually a quite a bit of information here that we can miss if we don't know to look for it. So let's take a, a more close look at this text. Mark tells us that the chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus. Now, it was a very anxious and tense time in the city of Jerusalem. Sound familiar at all over these last couple of weeks? Well, it was an anxious and tense time there as well. There were more people in the town than there would usually be because they were arriving to celebrate the Passover festival. The Roman Empire, fearing that all of these extra people in the city of Jerusalem would end up in a revolt of the Jewish people, had sent extra military personnel, uh, military troops to the city to maintain the order. And throughout the course of the week, beginning on Sunday, now to Wednesday, things had been growing more and more contentious between Jesus and the religious leaders uh, since Jesus had entered the city. In those few short days, he had talked out against the chief priests and scribes. He had embarrassed them. Uh, he had called them out for their ignorance of their, um, their knowledge of Jewish law and how that law should be applied. He had cleansed the temple of the money changers and the vendors who were taking advantage of people who were coming to make their sacrifices at the temple. Uh, but most importantly, Jesus represented a very real threat to their power. And because of these things, the chief priests and scribes wanted Jesus gone. In fact, they didn't just want him gone, they wanted him dead. But they couldn't just go and kill him. They had to find a legitimate legal reason to hold a trial against him that would result in a guilty verdict uh, that would bring a death penalty sentence with it. The priests and the scribes had been trying this entire week to find a reason to hold a trial against Jesus, but they had been unsuccessful. And their window of opportunity to do so was closing very quickly. They knew they couldn't do it during the festival of unleavened bread during Passover because, as Mark points out to us in verse 2, if they killed him during the festival or if they had a trial against him during the festival, the people would most likely revolt. And it's important to understand this reason why they had to get it done, why they had to have a trial brought against Jesus when they did, um, as we read the rest of the events that occurred on Wednesday. The chief priests and scribes were not going to be able to carry out their plan unless they had some help the help of someone who was close 
to Jesus and someone who could get valuable information to them. And that's why Mark tells us Judas did, what Judas did was so important to the successfulness of their plot to kill Jesus. Now, there are many different reasons and theories as to why Ju Judas chose to betray Jesus. Some of them are that he was tired of waiting for Jesus to assert himself as the Messiah and overthrow Rome. He was trying to nudge things along. Uh, another is that he didn't think that Jesus' method would work. Um, there's always the theory that Judas was a thief. He was greedy and he just did it for the money. Uh, the Gospel of John actually tells us that the devil entered G Judas's heart and made him do it. And in the Gospel of Judas, which is a book that was not uh, included in our biblical canon, uh, but does exist, according to the Gospel of Judas, Jesus asked Judas to do it because Christ knew that he would be the only one who would be able to do so. And so a lot of different theories um, as to why Judas did what he did, and Mark doesn't give us any clue. He doesn't give us any reason, just that he went to the chief priest to give Jesus up to them. And then Mark says this, when he heard it, they, the chief priests and scribes, were delighted and promised to give him money. And in this moment, the events that would occur over the next 40 out, 48 hours were set in motion. So that was a pretty important thing that happened on Wednesday of that final week of Christ's life. But something else very important also happened. Mark tells us that Jesus was in Bethany, which was about two miles to the east of the city of Jerusalem. And he was visiting the house of Simon, and Mark makes sure to tell us that Simon had leprosy. He had some kind of skin disease. And that disease would have made Simon ritualistically unclean, according to Jewish law. So no one was supposed to be around him. No one was supposed to touch him. He was supposed to stay away from people uh, to keep that leprosy, that skin disease, from spreading. Anybody who would have come in contact with Simon would also have been considered ritualistically unclean, whether or not they, they um, ended up getting leprosy themselves or not. Now Mark wants us to know that Jesus not only came in contact with Simon, but he also went to his house and ate dinner with him. This disregard for following Jewish law was just another reason for the chief priests and scribes to, be, to get even angrier with Jesus. But Mark tells us that while they were eating, a woman came and anointed Jesus' head with a very expensive jar of perfumed ointment. Mark doesn't tell us this woman's name, uh, but that is an unusual. Uh, at the time the Gospel of Mark was written, it was a very patriarchal society, and so the name of a woman who did something like this isn't necessarily something that he would have even thought to include. But he, did, he does tell us that people started yelling at this woman because she had wasted such an expensive perfume. But Jesus start, stops them. He tells them to stop because she has done something very important for him. He says that she has anointed his body ahead of time before his burial. And again, there's a lot that we can miss just in that very simple statement if we don't know what to look for. And it has a lot to do with this next spiritual practice that we're talking about, serving. Uh, notice what Jesus said. She, he said, she has anointed my body beforehand for, before its burial. Let's look at what this really means. Jesus had been telling his followers multiple times, on multiple occasions, what was going to happen. That he was going to be betrayed, that he was going to be arrested, that he was going to be killed, and that three days later he would resurrect from the dead. Nobody got it. Nobody understood this. Well, almost nobody. 
this unnamed woman had heard these prophecies of death and resurrection, and she believed. She believed Jesus. She got it. And she did, as Mark reports, Jesus saying what she could. She couldn't do much as a woman in a patriarchal society, but she did what she could. She thought, if you, Jesus, if you are going to die and rise, I should anoint you now because I might not ever have a chance to do it afterward. Thus she takes the jar of ointment and anoints his head. What this means is for Mark, she was the first believer. She believed what Jesus said without having to wait to find him in an to find an empty tomb a few days later. She believed what Jesus said. And for us, for us rather, she is the first Christian. She was the first person to trust in the promise of Christ's death even before it happened. So for us, she also models the kind of servanthood that we are called to exhibit as followers of Christ. Now, Judas was a servant. He had followed Jesus for three years, and he had seen everything that the rest of the disciples had seen, and he had done what Jesus had asked him to do. But he wanted to do it on his own terms. He wanted to do it the way that he wanted to. He wanted to do it the way that he thought things should be done, rather than doing what Christ wanted. This woman, on the other hand, was the complete opposite. She was willing to do what Christ needed her to do, regardless of what it cost her, regardless of what it meant for her, regardless of whether it was making other people angry or not. She was modeling the kind of servanthood that Christ would like us to model as well. Did you know that the word serve Serving, service, and servant appear in the Bible over 1,000 times. With that many mentions, it must be a pretty important idea. But why? Well, simply put, because God's primary way of working in our world is through people. It is through you and it is through me. We are meant to serve God by doing his work and his will in the world. And through this process, we don't just serve God. We're also serving others as well. People who are vulnerable or weak. People who are marginalized or poor. If we are to be the kind of follower Christ wants us to be, then we need to be concerned about these groups of people. After all, they were the ones that Jesus spent most of his time on earth with. He was with the tax collectors. He was with the lepers. He was with the people who were considered ritualistically unclean. To do this, to be servants to the people that Christ wants us to be servants to, we have to love people the way that God loves them. And we have to incorporate that love into our way of living and being. Throughout this worship series, we've been discussing what these different spiritual practices look like when we practice them corporately as well as individually. And to help us kind of visualize this, we've been using the idea of a closed fist and an open hand. The fist which is stronger, uh, represents us when we come together with fellow believers, with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ to do something uh, together. And then the open hand is, represents us doing these practices individually. When we come together and serve Christ as a church, we are able to do so much more than we are able to as individual. Now, most of us probably expected when we became part of a faith community that we would join with 
others in the community to do things. Um, and that's something that most churches do. We've done that here. We do that here. Uh, we've collected food for food pantries, for food insecurity on KU campus. Uh, we've done other things where we've come together uh, and joined forces uh, to serve um, our community here at Central. Um, we do it here, although we don't necessarily do it as much as we used to. And that's something that we will need to work on as we move forward. But besides working together, we are also called to serve as individuals. The prophet Micah advises us how to do this. Uh, Micah 6, 6 to 8, you might be familiar or have heard uh, this text before. It says, He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? The Hebrew word for kindness is hesed, and it has several different translations, including, excuse me, an act of goodness the recipient has no right to expect. Christians know this idea by something else. It's called grace. And we are meant to show grace, this undeserved kindness to others, as it has been shown to us by God. It's not really a difficult thing to do. It's not even a difficult idea to, to grasp. But we do have to be intentional about it because our tendency, our human tendency, is to look out for ourselves and not worry about the other person. But we always have to be on the lookout for ways to show kindness and grace to others. And in doing so, serve them by being God's proxy. Remember that the main way that God works in this world is through people. And when we serve others on God's behalf, we usher a little bit more of God's kingdom on earth, and we become more like Christ. I invite you to make an open palm and look at your hand for a moment. Most of us have five, five digits, five fingers on our hand. Can you imagine what our world would look like if each of us were to commit to doing five acts of kindness, five acts of service each week. How would your life be changed? How would the lives of others be changed? We have around 65 to 75 people who make their way, usually, to Central each week. If every one of those people did five acts of service a week, at the end of the year, this community of faith would have completed 16,900 acts. We also have about 100 people who claim uh, Central United Methodist as their community of faith. They might not be able to make it here each week, but around 100 people that call this, this church their home church. If we use that number, 100 people, doing five acts of kindness or service a week, that 16,900 at the end of a year would jump up to 26,000 acts of kindness or service in a year. Now, I'm sure you can guess what my challenge to you this week is going to be, five acts of kindness or service. And even though we're living uh, these days under a shelter-in-place order, there are still ways to do this. There are still ways to show kindness to others and serve them. You just have to be a little creative. Uh, but I have faith in you. Because if there was ever a time where acts of kindness and service have been needed, I think we would all agree that it is now. Maybe that act of service for you is running to the store for a neighbor or a friend. Maybe it's picking up the phone and calling to check on them. Maybe it's writing a letter to them and asking how things are going and making sure that they're not going uh, too stir-crazy. Um, there's lots of different ways to do this. Just get creative. And I would love to hear from you this week about the ways that you found to be a servant 
share them on Facebook, drop an email to the church. Um, we are hearing so much negativity right now. We're hearing a lot of scary statistics. We're hearing a lot of sad stories. Let's do our part to bring some happiness and some joy and some service into the world. Let's celebrate our sharing of God's grace with each other. So this week, look for the ways that you can be a servant on your own. And when we're able to join together once again corporately here in the sanctuary, uh, we will look for ways to serve together. Let us pray. Lord, you taught us that your glory is revealed when we, human beings made in your image, extend your love and care of us to others. Be with us as we answer your call to love our neighbor and serve those in need. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. A couple of uh, quick announcements uh, before we wrap up our worship this morning. We are still uh, trying to find ways to connect as a church and, and keep everybody in contact with one another. Uh, our adult Sunday school teacher, Todd Seifert, is leading a Bible study on Thursday evenings via Zoom. Uh, it's a Bible study on the letter to the church in Ephesus, uh, Ephesians. And so I would invite you to take part of that. You can get the link to Zoom uh, on our church website. And if you are having a difficult time figuring out, you do have to have Zoom installed either on your phone or your tablet or your computer. If you need help with that, please let me know. Um, we can send you instructions on how to get this onto your computer so you can participate uh, in that as well. And speaking of our website, we have a new one. Uh, the new web address is there on your screen. Uh, lawrencecentral.org. Uh, many thanks to our communications director, Missy Combs, uh, for the work that she has put uh, into that. Again, it was something that we kind of had to expedite and uh, make sure it was available to you. And so uh, there will still be some tweaks and some changes made on there. Uh, but that is our new website, and so make sure you uh, go and check that out and uh, let us know uh, what you think about that. Uh, thank you to everyone who um, is continuing to support our church by sending in your, your tithes and your offerings. Some of you are doing that uh, via the mail, the postal service. Uh, some of you also are, are uh, giving online. Uh, thank you for that continued support, because even uh, in shelter-in-place and stay-at-home orders, we are still called to be the church, and so um, we are doing uh, the best uh, that we can at that right now, and uh, appreciate you, um, your continued support. If you would like to give online, uh, the link to do so is on your screen, and so um, it, we invite you to take, uh, take advantage of that or to uh, continue to send uh, your tithes and your offerings in to support your church. Also, uh, again, a reminder, if you are in that uh, vulnerable category or in that category that should not be getting out and you need help in any way, please let us know. Uh, you can call the church office. Uh, the church office is going to be open just on Mondays. Uh, during these next weeks, but leave a voicemail. Those, uh, we are checking those messages daily. You can also send an email to the church. Janet is monitoring that, and she uh, will get any information to me that I need. Um, but please reach out to us. We have folks who are willing to help, and um, we just need to know what you need, so make sure that you let us know. Uh, again, my prayers are with you. I miss seeing you all in person. It's quite interesting. We have one person sitting in the very back today uh, and two people up in the balcony, and Karen, of course, is up here with me. Um, but it's quite interesting delivering a, a sermon and worshiping with an empty sanctuary. So 
Um, I miss you all. You are in my prayers. Uh, please let me know if there's anything that I can do for you. Um, and I look forward to the time that we can all be back here together. And I hope you are uh, looking forward to reconnecting with one another as well. As we conclude our worship this morning, our closing hymn is Yesu, Yesu, a song about serving. And as we are looking for ways that we can continue to serve during these days and weeks, uh, may the song uh, remind us of who the people are that we should be serving and remind us uh, of the joy that comes from serving. So I invite you to join at this time. receive this benediction. We are a people loved by God. We are a people blessed with hope. May the love of God, the grace of Christ, and the courage of the Holy Spirit strengthen our faith and set us loose to share God's love with all. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.